Hello everybody, how are you? Happy Pi Day! This is one of these special days of the year where somehow we all think about math. It's actually quite interesting how uh, on this particular day, just because it happens to be 3.14, because everyone's fascinated with Pi, we end up seeing stuff about this even in the, in the newspapers. I see that somebody just said there's a buzzing sound. I do want to make sure that we have a good audio connection. So just double checking, is there a terrible buzzing sound? If there is background buzzing noise, okay, I see a lot of people talking about that. Air conditioning, volume, we'll try to fix this in a second. Oh, that's over here. So let me go and see what I can do to fix that for you. Oh, I just heard a different beep. That's, uh, that's my Pi. I gotta go and get that, hang on a second. So first we gotta just adjust the sound. I'm gonna pull it down a little bit. Let's see what we got here. Okay, people are saying the buzz is annoying. Did it make it better? Just double checking. Is the buzz better now or is it, is it, is it still bad? Okay, so might be the refrigerator, still buzz. Um, we'll do our best that we can. I'm gonna drop it down a bit more. It'll make it a little bit quieter and hopefully this is okay. Might be the camera. Never heard a buzz, no difference. It's so quiet. <laughs> okay, so I think this is fine. I think just turn the volume down a little bit, I guess. We'll do the best. And what we'll do, what we'll do is we'll, we'll always, I always take the feedback that you guys have. We'll try to do the best with it. So, okay, great. Well, let's go ahead then. I, actually, let me, go and, let me go and get my pie, one moment. Yeah, so it's pie day. So this happens to be a, it's a pot pie, actually. Uh, I'll leave it here for a little bit, all right? Uh, so let's continue. So, but, but we're gonna do some math problems first, right? Because what happened here is that we happen to find that there are some interesting questions, right? And these are the questions that were actually submitted by, our, uh, by the people who have been working with our course. And let's go and talk about some of these. Actually, this is a live solve because I haven't done all of these questions yet. Uh, let's go and find out. I've done the one that I came up with. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you that one. But what we have here is what we decided to go and see whether or not people would come up with some neat questions for us to think about. Somebody is asking how to make pumpkin pie. So that, I, I don't know. Uh, can I eat the pie later on the stream? I probably will as I get to these questions which are hard. So let's go ahead and start playing with some problems and see what happens. So right here, I do want to emphasize, these are questions that are created by our amazing students. And, and one was made by me. Uh, and don't share them elsewhere without permission, please. All right, problem time. What have we got here? Oh, so we've got a problem here by Eddie Kong. Okay, so I want to make sure that I can see this. Let me do that. Right, so Leo rolls a six-sided die. What is the probability that the average of the two numbers he rolls is greater than pi? Your answer should be in the form a over b, where a and b are integers with no common factors. Okay, so the interesting thing here is if I have the average of two numbers, the average of two numbers that come from dice are always either whole numbers or like half integers, like they have a half in them. Okay, greater than pi just means that it's 3.5 or higher, all right? So if I translate the problem, what this is saying is I'm basically saying, what's the probability that the sum of the numbers, the two numbers, is bigger than 2 pi. <laughs> so 2 pi is funny. Actually, 2 pi, it's, it's pi day, right? And this is the day that a lot of people also say, I like tau better. Some people actually write the letter tau to represent 2 pi. Okay, this is just fun fact. Tau happens to be uh, about 6.28. Okay. And so I just need to know whether or not the sum of the two numbers is more than 6.28. That's if the sum of the two numbers is seven or higher, okay? So the question is just asking, what is the probability of the sum of the two numbers being at least seven? Okay. So, okay, so that's not so bad. Actually, whenever I think of these things with six-sided dice, oftentimes the way I do this is I actually just draw a little chart, and the chart happens to be, good, we got some space, the chart happens to be a six by six, right? 
because it's, it's very geometrical to me, actually. Uh, if I have a 6x6 six six chart, this is a chart of like all of the different outcomes I can get when I roll dice. So there's one thing for the first die, one thing for the second die. All right, just reading this, it's just rolling. Ah, it says two numbers he rolls. So that there's, there's going to be rolling two six-sided dice. That's important. All right, so th this is like there's the first die and there's the second die. And this thing is the first die. You either got one, two, three, four, five, or six with the first die. And with the second die, you either got one, two, three, four, five, or six with the second die die. And whenever I do this, I'm like, I know what 7 is. You'll get 7 from all of these. Let's draw, let's draw check marks. These are the ones that I do want to count. Right? Like, in all of those, you get 7. Like, 1 plus 6, 2 plus 5, and so on. And if I just keep going, um, all of these are the ones that you want to count. You want to know what's the probability that you're inside all of this zone. Right? And if you look at this, you've got a nice pattern. The number of these check marks, I did them by diagonals, right? This is the 6 plus 6, 12. I have like a 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6. That's like how many check marks I drew. The number of check marks is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 because I went counting them in diagonals. And that's nice. That's the sum of an arithmetic progression where I just have the same change every time. And so that's equal to the number of terms, how many there are, times the average. Let me write that in words first. This is like how many. This is how I always think of this. How many multiplied by the average. All right? How many is six? And the average, since they're all in order of going by the same amount every time, that will be the average of the first one and the last one because they're equally spaced. And it's easier for me to cancel the 6 against the 2 this way. And so I get 3 times 6, sorry, 3 times 7, which is 21. And that's the sum of the numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the answer to the whole problem is going to be 21 divided by 36. But don't forget to simplify. Whenever you happen to have uh, a fraction, you need to divide out by the common factor. And here there's a common factor of 3. And you get 7 over 12. So I think the answer to this question is 7 over 12. Uh, let's go and see if that's the correct answer. It is. That's good. Okay. Maybe we can uh, try this pie. Is that any good? Yeah. Woo, it's hot. Okay. So this is, this is a little bit hot. Maybe I have to wait for it to cool down. It's legit. Okay. Okay. Let's keep going. This is a pot pie. It's not like a not like a sweet pie. But sweet pies are good too. Next question. Hmm. If a turtle walks around the circumference of a circle with radius pi kilometers at uh, for pi days uh, at pi kilometers per hour, how many full laps around the circle does he complete? Oh my gosh, so many pies. All right. So, oh, this is interesting. There's going to be like lots of pies in here, because. The, we are walking around the circumference, okay? Let's look at the total distance that's moved first. And thank you, Gordon Lee, for contributing this question. So the total distance is equal to, well, oh, actually, we have pi days at pi kilometers per hour. So that's how I should figure this out. Uh, because I need to know the, the distance, and then I'll have to divide by the circumference, right? So I have pi days at pi kilometers per hour. That is equal to pi times 24 hours. That's how many hours, right? Because it's pi days. And then um, it's uh, pi kilometers per hour times pi. Let's put another parenthesis. Pi kilometers per hour. So I see the units will actually cancel. The hours will cancel the hours. And so the number of the total distance is pi squared times 24 kilometers. I'm very careful with units here, because on this particular question, I need to worry about whether or not uh, we have things in days, hours, kilometers, and whatnot. OK. Now I need to know how many laps. So what's the circumference? 
<coughs> the circumference is 2 times pi times the radius, and the radius is pi kilometers. So 2 times pi times the radius, which is pi kilometers, which is 2 pi squared kilometers. Oh, okay, it's a nice number, so let's just divide, right? The total distance divided by the circumference, how many full laps does he complete? Looks like this turtle is not doing that bad. 24, divide, 24 pi squared, 24 pi squared divided by 2 pi squared, which is equal to 12 laps, okay? This is pretty good. Uh, I think the answer is 12. I will say, by the way, this turtle... This, tur this turtle is not bad. Like, the speed of the turtle is pi kilometers per hour. I think I walk at about pi kilometers per hour. Oh, oh, it's kilometers, not miles. Hmm. Maybe a turtle could be that fast. I don't know. How fast is the turtle? I always thought turtles were supposed to be slow. Um, but for one thing, this is a really tough turtle because this turtle is just walking day and night uh, for pi days. Okay, this is serious. This is serious. This, this turtle has some crazy ability. Okay, <laughs> so let's see what we got here. Um, I think that the answer is 12. Let's see if this works. Somebody said that it, it, it can be fast in water, but let's see. 12! That was correct. Okay, that calls for some more pie. This time I broke the crust open, so um, at least it won't be that hot on the second bite. All right, next one. In the figure below, B, C, D, E is a square. Uh, triangles B, F, G, trying to look at this, and this is a question by Austin Zhang. I just want to make sure I can read it right, because not everyone can see the colors. Let me make sure you can see the numbers. This is a 6. I want to make sure everyone can read this. There's a 6 here, and there's an 8 here. All right? So I got some square. Uh, and the square is B, C, D, E, that's starting from up here, B, and then C, and then D, and then E, okay? And I've got some triangles, B, F, G, that's this triangle, uh, C, I, F, that's this triangle, D, H, I is this triangle, and uh, E, G, H is this triangle, and they're all congruent. Also, I happen to have that B, F is 6, that was this one, and C, uh, F was, uh, F, C was 8, okay? And then now I have a lot of things which are equal. I have that B, G which is this one, that's the single tick, is equal to CF, that's also the single tick. Ah, the things that are marked with one little tick, those are all equal to each other. You can see how I'm trying to read all these problems. And also, if I want to look at the other thing, the EG, that's telling me about, where is EG? This thing, double ticks. The things with double ticks, those are all equal as well. Okay? The area of the inscribed circle is equal to A pi, where A is an integer. What is the value of a? Okay, I need to find the area of this circle. So the area of a circle is pi times r squared. Hmm, well, what could I do here? If I have this, I see 6 and 8. I like 6 and 8. 6 and 8 are nice numbers for the Pythagorean theorem. For example, this thing is 6, right? So if I have this 6 and I have this 8, then suddenly I have a right triangle, and I have some way of trying to find this particular side. And in this particular case, 6 and 8 are like two common numbers. I mean, not two common numbers, but I mean it's related to one very nice triangle. This is double of something where you have 3 and 4. And we've seen all over the place the Pythagorean theorem is going to give you 3, 4, 5, right? This is the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is the square root of 25, which is 5. But it's 2 times it, so it's 10. All right, so now I know that this whole thing is 10, and I just need to know the radius. Hmm, that looks like 2 radii give me 10. So suddenly I know that the radius is 5, okay? So now I know that the radius is 5, and so then the area of the inscribed circle is equal to pi times the radius squared which is 25 pi, and the question was to find out what is the a. I think the answer is 25. Let's see. Is this right? Oops. I made a mistake. 1.25? Hang on a second. My guess is that that's actually correct, <laughs> because the question says, what is the value of a? And 
uh, is an integer. So I'm going to say, I think the answer is 25. It could have been that the particular uh, slide deck that we have here is not quite up to date. But I will say, I think the answer is 25. We will continue on with that. 25. There must be, oh, one might be the question number. Somebody says one might be the question or something. But 25 was correct, people are saying. Let's keep going. And these questions are submitted by all different people. That was by Austin. I, I, I see that Austin has also said, OK, good. So this is Austin Zhang's question. Let's keep going. Question number four. What is this? Uh, great. Suppose that the variables p, i, r, and c are positive integers. And 2 p, i, r equals c, i, r, c. Oh, this is so clever. OK, so it's like 2 pi, r is the circumference, except that these all represent positive integers. OK, and c is less than 31.4. Now, what's the biggest possible value I could have for p? And I'm supposed to multiply the letters. The first thing I'll do is I'll say I've got positive integers. Therefore, if I have the same integer appearing on both sides, I can cancel it because dividing it by, I won't divide by 0. Okay? So if I see that I have 2 p i r, what I see is that the i is repeated and the r is also repeated. And so it won't actually matter what those two are, what, what those different two letters are, OK? Because as long as I, you know, whatever I picked, as long as I picked some positive integers, that's not going to make any difference. So now I know that 2p is equal to c squared. OK, if I have 2p equals to c squared, now I want to know what's the biggest possible value of p where, uh, yeah, 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 where what I have here is that the c squared, well, c is up to 31.4. OK, so we make C as large as possible. So you make C right up close to 31.4, just minus a tiny bit. And what I'm, what I'm going to say here is, since I'm not going to get an integer when I square that, I'm OK just squaring that and then saying, what's the closest I get to it? OK? So C is right up to 31.4, uh, a bit less. OK? A bit less. Now, if I want to do this, now I need to actually go and figure out what happens if I go and square 31.4, and then I divide that by 2. OK, let's go ahead and do it. 31.4. Now, this is actually not bad, because um, pi squared is actually pretty close to a, a, a nice number. But let, let's, let's go and see what this is, OK? 4 times 4 is 16. Uh, 4 times 1 is 4, plus 1 is 5. Uh, 4 times 3 is 12, OK? And then there's a 4, a 1, and a 3. 3 times 4 is 12. 3 times 1 is 3, plus a 1 is 4. 3 times 3 is 9. So I get 6, 9, uh, 2, 2, so that's 5. And then I have 4 plus 4 is 8, and I have a 9. And it goes down to here, 985.96. Do I believe that? Yes, I do. I'll tell you why I believe that. It's because there's a bit of me that remembers some neat thing about pi. Pi squared, what we just found out here is this is 31.4. So we just found out that 10 pi squared is close to 1,000. And that's all right, because I remember that pi squared is close to 10. So if anyone has 10 for you and you want to just find another way to write 10, you can just use pi squared and it's close enough. Of course, this is a terrible idea because pi squared is a big mess. But somehow, if you ever have to do pi squared, it's going to be somewhat close to 10. Okay. And c is a positive integer. Uh, very, very good that somebody asked that, because otherwise I could go and make p huge, right? But c is a positive integer. OK. Well, in that case, if I want to go and find out what's the biggest possible value for p, let's divide this thing by 2. And if I divide this by 2, I can already see I don't need the rest of the stuff, the, the rest of the digits after the decimal. If I divide by 2, then that's equal to, let's start halving things. Half of 9 is 4. Then I have 18. That's a 9. Um, and then I have 2, because of that's the 5, point, and it's 19, it's like 9 stuff. <clears throat> so what I just found out here is that the maximum possible value of p is going to be something like 492. I think that that's what we've got here. Oh, wow, I made a mistake. <laughs> oh no, I made a mistake. So the first thing is I got the question wrong. So I got the question wrong because I didn't read it careful. Uh, I didn't read it carefully enough. I was like, oh, like, let's, let's squeeze c all the way up. But... I actually made a mistake because C is supposed to be a positive integer. So I was going to report this answer, but I was wrong. All right, And this is what you see. Um, 
unfortunately, sometimes I do, I do make mistakes as I do these questions, and I read it too fast. That's what happens with these math competitions. And so with those positive integers, well, then I know that C has to go up to 31, okay? So in that case, I can't go that. I can't do that. No, no, no. Make C equals 31. Okay, so all I have to do is take 31 squared and divide by 2. That's not going to work. How am I supposed to get a positive integer if I take an odd number and divide by 2? No, that doesn't work either. So I have to go and take 30. You see, we're, we're working backwards. We're like, couldn't use that. You couldn't use 31. You've got to use 30. Now we're in good shape because now I just go and say 30 times 30, that's 900. Oh, I didn't even need to do this nonsense. So, so it's like 30 times 30 is 900. 900 divided by 2 is then 450. So I'll say that the answer that we want is 2p equals to 900, so p is equal to 450. So that's actually what we'll put. Although I'll tell you, I'll tell you why I got, uh, I got carried away. I got carried away because I actually assumed that the person who was making this problem was trying to use the fact that pi squared is really close to 10. Because to me, like, that's a neat fact. So I was like, I wonder if the person making this wanted to go and show people, hey, pi squared is close to 10. And then that's why I did all of this. And it's like, yeah, pi squared is pretty close to 10. If you actually had 3.14, 3.14, you get 9.85. This is pretty good. Actually, what this also shows is if you're taking high school physics class, uh, there's also something called the gravitational acceleration constant, which is like 9.8 meters per second squared. What you now see is that you should just use pi squared for that instead. Just kidding. You shouldn't. But let's keep going. So that's, that's this question. The answer should be 450. Let's see what we actually have. Yes, that is the answer. Okay, good. Next question. Can you graph 1 over pi x. Yes, I can. Uh, I'm guessing that what you want me to draw here is y equals 1 over pi times x. All right. So if you have these kinds of things, so this is kind of nifty. These questions are just submitted by students. And so what we decided to do is we decided to pull together questions that students would have. And this is another thing. Um, and y equals 1 over x is actually nice to graph. If I wanted to graph y equals 1 over x, that one looks nice. It's like really, really symmetrical too. What happens if you graph 1 over x is, you see why is it it's symmetrical? Oh, let's just talk about that. That's cool. Uh, the reason it's symmetrical is because if you multiply both sides by x, it's xy equals 1. And that means if I found a pair of numbers, x comma y, that multiplies to 1, then y comma x does also. That's what gives it a certain symmetry across a diagonal. And if I want to graph it, it ends up looking something like this. And the other side, there's also negative, stu negative stuff that does that too. So this is the graph of y equals 1 over x. And as I said, there's this nice symmetry. The nice symmetry is across this line right here. Pretend it's symmetric. And this line here is the y equals x line. And the reason is because if I had some point here, like 4 comma 1 quarter, well, there's another one over here, 1 quarter comma 4. So it's going to look like this. That's 1 over x. And now, here's what you do. If you want to go and graph y equals 1 over pi times x, you cheat. And you just draw this same picture, and you just label the y-axis with a different scaling. I know that usually when you graph, you want to make it so that if you want to go by one unit, you go one unit. And if you want to go one unit that way, it's the same distance. But if you use like your graphing calculator or any kind of Desmos or anything, you know you can actually go and adjust the scaling, and it's like squished. It's like if you took a picture of somebody, and you decided to resize it in a totally weird way, and you're like, man, your face looks completely squished this way because you just kind of squished it in the resize. So what I mean is, here's how I'll do it. If I want to know what is pi over x, I just will label the axes where this is a 1. Wait. Not pi over x. I don't want pi over x. I want 1 over pi x. Okay? So 1 over pi x. Let's adjust it. If I want 1 over pi x. Now, when x equals 1, y equals 1 over pi. So it's going to look like this. Here's a 1. And here is 1 over pi. And this is, of course, negative 1. And this is, of course, negative 1 over pi. That's it! I just graphed it! 
The reason this works is because that's just a rescaling. Effectively, what happens if you want to go from y equals 1 over x and you want to get y equals 1 over pi x is you just want to smoosh your heights by a factor of pi, right? What I'm trying to do here is I'm, I'm basically telling you I would have a lot of trouble drawing you a graph of this like y equals 1 over pi x just from scratch, but I can draw you a very symmetrical graph, <laughs> sort of symmetrical graph, of y equals 1 over x and then squash the axes uh, so that I just kind of rescaled. I said like that's 1 over pi, so that's 2 over pi, that's 3 over pi, and so on. Did that make sense? This is, this is actually the answer. So the answer is yes, and the answer is the graph actually looks pretty legit because that graph was OK for y equals 1 over x. And then now, you know, we managed to do it uh, where we just relabeled the axes. OK, why didn't we have an E day? You know, we really need to have an E day. Somebody just asked me, why don't we have an E day? We totally should. This is E day, OK? E day is on 272, uh, 2.718, right? So like on the 72nd day of February, you should have an E day. <laughs> yeah, it's because unfortunately there's, there's not a 272. Some people, by the way, some people, by the way, say that E day is 217. Uh, sorry, 27. And in particular, in the year, in the year 2018, there was an E day. <gasps> anyway, uh, but, the, but the problem is that you know you can't be like, all right, the next the next time is 2718, we're going to have an E day. You might be waiting like 98. Oh my gosh, it's 2021 already, 97 years. All right, next question, next question, next question. Hmm. Oh yeah, that's what it looks like. Somebody else graphed this so we can see what this looks like. Next question, what is this? Let's go and have some pie while we go and look at this problem. Hmm. Becky has some perfectly spherical oranges. Always, always, every math problem is about perfectly spherical or perfectly round or whatever. Not bad. Where's my pen? OK. Three perfectly spherical oranges to make orange juice. Uh, and each orange is 7 centimeters in diameter. The peel is 0.5 centimeters thick. A cubic centimeter of peeled orange can make one milliliter of orange juice. One cubic centimeter is actually the same thing as one milliliter. So I guess that sort of makes sense. All right. The volume of juice in milliliters that Becky can make is in the form a pi, where a is an integer. What is a? Contributed by Shu Shun Song. Thank you very much, Shu Shun. So now what we have here is we've got these oranges, all right? Three. Oh, oh, don't forget I've got three oranges. I might make a mistake if I forget that there's a three. Next thing we need to do is we need to say, oh, the peel. The peel's bad, all right? So if I have a seven centimeter in diameter orange, It's been a while since I saw a blue orange. There aren't any blue oranges. I don't have an orange color, but this is the closest we can get. OK, so I've got this thing. We're not making lemon juice. We're making orange juice. These are like slightly unripe oranges. All right, so we got these things. Uh, and then and then we got this thing. The orange is 7 centimeters in diameter. The peel is 0.5 centimeters thick. But there's two parts of the peel. So you're going to lose one centimeter on the both sides. OK? So what we just found out is that Let's pretend that the, ah, yeah, yeah, there are these like red oranges in the middle, right? Is it called like kara kara oranges? I think it is. So yes, you're right, I could mix the two colors, but that, that actually doesn't work in the way I draw. If I was using a real pen, I could do that, but this is a digital pen, it doesn't mix. But I'm saying like if you don't count the peel, that part when you don't count the peel, that's going to be six across. Six across, these are centimeters. And so what that's telling me is that each orange is giving me a three centimeter radius of stuff. So what I get is peeled orange is giving me uh, a radius of three centimeters. Okay, so now I'm going to go and try to make some orange juice, or Becky is going to, and we're going to have, I guess we need to know what is the volume of a sphere. This is actually a fancy formula that many people will learn at some point in geometry. It's actually useful for these middle school math competitions also. And so what we have is that the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi times r cubed. Okay, And the r happens to be 3. And actually, there's a whole lesson that one can teach about this. I used to, I used to give this lesson in the in-person talks that I, that I went around giving. 
But uh, today we'll just kind of go through because we have a bunch of problems. So now r is 3. That's nice. So that will give me 3 times 3 times 3, canceling one of those, right? So this is 4 thirds pi 3, 3, 3. <clears throat> and so what I get is 3 times 3 is 9, times 4 is going to be 36. All right, so I've got here uh, 9 times 4, 36 pi. Next, the question does say I have three of the oranges. I wanted to make sure I don't forget that. All right, so three of these oranges, and I need to know the volume that I end up making. So it's in milliliters. I don't have to convert from liters to milliliters or back and forth or whatever. And so I just need to know how many cubic centimeters there are. Therefore, I just need to multiply this by three. Three oranges is equal to three times 36 pi. And three times 36 is a nice number. That's 108. So I think the answer to the question is 108. Ah, that's my guess. Let's go and find out. What have we got? Yes, it's 108. So that works well. That's good. Oranges. Interesting. You know, like if you think about fruits, there are apple pies, there are strawberry pies, there are peach pies, there are banana pies, there are lime pies. Has anyone ever had an orange pie before? How come there's no orange pie? Somebody should go and invent the orange pie. Yeah, there's a banana cream pie. I hope I'm not making everyone hungry. But like there's all these different kinds of pies. How come no one ever made an orange pie? This is the first time in my life I've ever asked that question. I'm just like, that's really interesting. I've had all different kinds of fruits in pies, but not oranges. Anyway, okay, someone make orange pie. Yeah, 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 orange pie. You might have a new invention. And then it's like, my gosh, it took until the year 2021 for people to go and make orange pies. Yeah, okay, some people are saying it might taste bad, but there is a key lime pie, right? And so that one tastes good. All right. And now we've got all these different things. Pumpkin. <laughs> Somebody just said pumpkin pie is already orange. Well said. All right. I think I'm going to go on to the next question. And let's go and get ready. Oh, this is my question. Okay, so I guess I actually, I, I think I know the answer. Let's go and find out. Hmm. So this question I made this question while I was getting a haircut. As you can tell, I got a haircut. And I was like, I should go and contribute a question for the Pi Day thing too. Oh, I see. That's why it's question number seven. So now, the, the interesting thing about this is I was just kind of curious while I was getting my haircut. I was like, you know, I've seen when you put six, you know, I've seen when you put like, you can make these hexagonal shapes with pennies, green pennies, whatever. It's like if you go and make pennies and you go and line them up like this, you make a really nice pattern. I don't know if anyone's ever done. Uh, have you guys ever done this before? I don't know if you ever play with pennies. But I used to like move pennies around when I was smaller and be like, wow, look at that. You can pack them all together. It looks really nice. Green rusted pennies, those exist, okay? This is legit. This is more legit than the blue oranges. But so I've got all of these like green pennies, right? And I, I, I used to do this, like line them up. And I was like, wow, that's really neat. You can line them up and it's packed like that. And so while I was getting a haircut, I was like, I wonder what happens if you put seven of them. By the way, this is seven, so if you, if you try to put one penny in the middle, it will have a gap. And so the question was, how much is there, how many centimeters are there in this uh, outer perimeter? Let's assume that the coins have diameter of one centimeter each. Hmm. Well, how to do this? Well, after thinking about it for a while, it was like, oh, actually, if I look at these coins, here's the center of the circle. Here is this part that goes to that point of tangency. Here's this part that goes to that point of tangency. If only I could figure out what fraction of the circle was out here, that'd be great. I just need to know the fraction of the circle out here and multiply that by seven, and that will tell me like how many circumferences I want, right? So if I want to do that, actually you go look over here and you say, wait a second, this is a straight line. <clears throat> and if I went over here, this is a straight line. This is the center, another straight line. Center, another straight line. Center, straight line. Center, straight line. And this connects. So look at that. I have a seven-sided gone. Seven gone. 
What are those called? Septagons. Septagon. Uh, you don't use these very often. But so these are seven-sided polygons. So all I need to know is like, what's the degree measure around here? And then that'd be great. Yeah. Oh, is it a heptagon? Heptagon. Heptagon or septagon? I'm not sure. But I think heptagon, though, uh, that sounds more right somehow. Okay. So if I have all of this, if I have a heptagon, I just need to know what's the angle outside. There are multiple ways to do this. One way is to cut the heptagon into lots of triangles. And that's one way of finding these internal angles. And you take 360 degrees minus it. I usually prefer to do the external angles. For an external angle, what I mean is if I have this straight line, I just continued it like a straight line. This angle here, this is exactly 360 degrees divided by 7, the number of sides. And the reason is because, I, I often teach this in, the, in my classes, but it's like if you're an ant crawling, and you get to here, how much do you turn by? You turn by that. Then you get here, and how much do you turn by? The same thing. In fact, if you're an ant and you're crawling around, you're going to turn by this thing, and you're going to do that turn seven times. And guess what? When you get back to where you started, you just did a 360, which is why I can't do that with my hand, because then my hand would fall off. And so the, the thing is, if I have to do the same thing seven times and get to 360, it better be 360 divided by 7 for each one. That's nice, okay? But now this is good, because here's how I think of it. I'm like, I want to know what fraction of the circle's circumference is around here. 360 over 7 is telling me that's one-seventh of a circumference. Hmm. That's one-seventh of a circumference. That's what I'm going to call it. One-seventh of a circumference. Okay. That means that this part which is out there is a seventh of a circumference plus a half of a circumference. This part is equal to half a circumference. Now, I liked that because I didn't want to actually work out one-seventh of a circumference because I want to multiply this thing all the way by seven. I have seven of these things. So my answer is how many circumferences? Well, seven times a seventh plus a half. I like that because multiplying seven by one-seventh is nice. So the answer is equal to seven times one-seventh plus one-half of a circumference. which is equal to 7 times a 7th is 1. 7 over 2 is the 7 over 2, so that's 9 over 2 circumference. That's 9 over 2 circumference. Oh, right, but that's not what the question asked. The question said that I have the diameter of each coin is 1 centimeter, and I want to know what's the answer. Oh, okay, well, the circumference, if you have a diameter of one centimeter, the circumference is pi times the diameter. That's pi, right? Pi is the ratio of the circumference divided by the diameter. And so I have 9 over 2 times, I don't want to make the 9 look like an A. I have 9 over 2 times pi centimeters, because it's pi times the di diameter. And so that looks like A has, wait, what? I made a mistake. That can't be right. So if that's the case, it says a is an integer. So now I'm going to look at the question more carefully. I'm like, OK, I've got all of these things going around. I've got these halves. OK, I've got seven of them. And so it's 1 seventh of the circumference plus the 1 half. This is OK. The diameter of the coins are 1 centimeter each. So the circumference is pi times 1. Seems OK. So actually, it looks to me like the answer, hmm, it says my answer should be in the form a pi, where a is an integer. but where have I gone wrong? So let's see. Half of the circumference. Huh. The coins have diameter one centimeter each. The circumference is pi times the diameter, which is just plain pi. I actually think the answer is nine over two. So I'm going to say it might be. It might be that the if somebody's told me the circumference is two pi. But no, because the diameter is actually the diameter is one. Okay, now I'm, now I'm a little bit curious, because I'm like, the answer I got is 9 over 2. Let's see. 9. That means I'm off by a factor of 2. Why? Somebody help me with this. So, so what's going on here? Uh, or either that, or there's, a, or, there's a, or there's a typo here. Of course, A is supposed to be an integer, but what, 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 what went wrong here? This is where I need my help. This is where I need help. So I'm going to go and eat some pie while we go and see what's going on here. 
maybe I meant to say the radius is 1. That's actually quite possibly what was, the, there might have been a typo in the way this was transcribed over here. I see people are saying we should actually switch the, switch the question to be radius instead of diameter. This is correct. Mm, 2 pi r is right. So 2 pi r, but here the r is 1 half. So it's actually, this is okay. So I'm going to say, I think what's going on here is that there's probably just some typo in the way this was transcribed onto the slide, and it should have probably corresponded to radius being 1 centimeter instead. We clearly forgot to assume that 1 equals 1 half. Well said. But so I'll say that the, uh, for the question as written here, the answer is going to be 9 over 2. Let's continue, and let's see what else we've got. Question 8 by Emily Huang. There are two circles, one with radius 2 and one with radius 1. They are internally tangent at point A. Square ABCD is inscribed inside the circle with radius 2, and the area that's inside both the square and the smaller circle is uh, A plus B pi over C, where I've got some integers and there's no common factors. Wow, let's draw this and find out. So I've got two circles, one with radius 2 and one with radius 1, and they're internally tangent. Thank you, Emily Huang, for the question. So here's one circle, sort of like a blob. Now here's another one. It's always <clears throat> harder to draw the second circle after the first one's there. But actually, in this case, the second circle is better than the first one. So I've got radius 2, radius 1, internally tangent at point A. Next, uh, square ABCD is inscribed inside the circle with radius 2. Oh, okay. So if I do that, it's going to make these four, like sort of the top, bottom, left, and right. We're going to make a square there. Let's just go and make it sort of clockwise, A, B, C, and D. All right, there's going to be a square there. I guess I should draw a square. All right, so we got the square here. And now uh, we have... Okay, the area that's inside both the square and the smaller circle. Ah, nice question. So I want to know what is the area that's inside both the square and the smaller circle. So I want to know how much area is here. Okay, if I see that, it tells me maybe I should just go and find the area of the whole smaller circle minus these little pieces. Oh, no, 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 I have a better way. No, 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 I can find it by just adding it up. I think. Because that's where drawing the diagram. Now I'm kind of wondering, is this diagram really drawn to scale in a way where I believe it? Because it looks pretty good. So now let's go and start staring at this diagram, okay? Hmm. Well, the center of this circle is here. All right? And the center of the circle is like one unit, one unit. And of course, um, a circle would mean that I, I could go up one unit here too. Yeah. Yeah. It actually goes through that point. I'm basically thinking about the coordinates here. I'm like, well, that's a 1. That's a 1. And this is a 1. And it's a right angle. And if I look at this particular diagonal line that's going through, if I have this thing which is 2 up, and this is 2 across, this line is going to have one point here, which is 1 across and 1 up. What I'm emphasizing is that if I go from the center of the circle, go straight up, from the center of the circle, I'll get to that point, okay? So, actually, the place where this, this, uh, this, this particular funny shape is, is that I've got half of a circle on this side, and I've got two triangles. I can do that. That seems quite reasonable. So what I have on the left side is yellow. What I have on the right side is pink. The yellow side is one half of the circle. So I have one half of pi r squared, and r is 1, so that's 1 half of the pi, uh, plus on the other side I have this like 1 half, so I half the circle is from the half, and here I've got two, oh let's do it this way, one triangle. I've got a base and I've got a height. The base is 2 and the height is 1. Half base times height is half of 2 times 1, which is 1. Another way I often think about these is if you just took this guy here, this bottom piece, bottom triangle, and moved it up here, you'd make a nice square. If you can imagine, you could make a square here by just taking this guy and turning it around. And that'll give you a 1. 
So I'm getting that you know, the answer happens to be 1 plus 1 half times pi. So 1 plus, and I'm looking at the way this is written, I'm guessing it's that, yes, b and c have no common factors. So it's like 1 plus 1 pi over 2 is, I think, what we got here, right? So I can rewrite this as 1 plus 1 pi over 2. And so what I found out is that a equals 1, b equals 1, and c equals 2. And that's what I'll put for the answer here. If you're curious, if you, if you popped in on this live stream, the goal of what we made for the difficulty level is we're trying to make something that's more welcoming, something that would be interesting to as wide an audience of people as possible. That's why, if you're curious, how come the questions we were just doing on the Math Counts chapter Invitational were so much harder? The reason is because that was a, that's a contest, and that was already like the third round or something of the contest. That's why those were harder. But here we're doing something where we're trying to get everybody who's you know learning algebra and geometry to go and play with some questions and notice some interesting patterns. So what we have here is, I think, 1, 1, and 2. Let's see. Yes, it is. Thank you, Emily. And that's actually the end. This was the end of the, of the, of the problems that we had for this Pi Day, uh, for this, uh, these, these eight questions. With that, you know, what we usually do is, if we have got a few minutes left, uh, we'll allow for like random questions. Let me just switch over to this. So this was, this was what, we, what we set out to do. We, we were trying to bring people's attention to go and play with some you know, fun puzzles about Pi. Hope that you like the questions. And I actually also, we wanted to do this because we wanted to give people a chance to make questions. We got so many interesting submissions, actually. We got more interesting submissions than we had time to, than we could put onto, the, onto this kind of a thing for everyone else to work on. And so if you did send us a submission, thank you. Because actually thinking of a good problem is harder than solving a good problem. And so we were trying to engage our community to let everyone get that feeling of thinking of a good problem. All right. Question time. So, aha, uh -huh. why is there tau? Why do people like to have like this two times pi? You know, it's like, it's because you see, pi is, you use pi as like two pi r, right? So you could also say, why do we always do two pi r? Just have a number of times r. And that might seem reasonable. At that point, then you'd say, I'm not going to use 3.14. I'll say the circumference of a circle is just 6.28 times the radius. So, it's a convention, and somehow pi ended up being what people used. I have a guess of why a long time ago people preferred pi. It's because it's a lot easier to measure the diameter of the circle. You just kind of measure the diameter. You don't have to divide it by two. If you want to measure the radius of the circle, you have to kind of guess what's the middle, and then measure from there to the edge. Actually, diameter is the easier thing you measure. In fact, I believe that's why if you buy tires or if you buy a bicycle, we always measure wheels by their diameter, not their radius. Somebody else asked, uh, how is the pie? Is the pie good? Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. And I'm also pretty hungry. Hmm. More questions. What was the Easter egg? I'm not sure. I don't think we made an Easter egg. Maybe someone else knows. Mm. Mm. Oh, wow. OK. It, pi is the ratio of diameter and circumference, but how does it appear so many places in math? The reason is because a circle is one of the most fundamental things in the world. It's very symmetrical. You just kind of go around. And a lot of things are symmetrical. For example, if you have some particle in the world, uh, in the universe, an electron, electron, a negatively charged particle, it makes some forces on things around it, and that's very symmetrical. You have the same kind of force, no matter what angle the thing is away from you, or from the electron, all that matters is the distance. And for example, somebody asked, how does pi relate to Fibonacci, or does it? Hmm. I'm pretty sure you could probably find some relationship between pi and Fibonacci. Um, I'm thinking to myself, it's like, I know that I can make pi appear whenever you have something called factorials. Because it turns out that uh, factorials, you know, like 5 factorial, that's 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. There are approximations to factorials that involve pi inside them. Fibonacci's don't run with factorials too often actually, so I, I, don't, I don't have an immediate one off the top of my head, but I wouldn't be surprised if you could go and find some way to do that. Hmm. 
<laughs> Explain the Frobenius coin problem, somebody asked. Yeah, there's an interesting puzzle of like, uh, it's often called the postage stamp problem or the chicken McNugget theorem, which says if you can buy stamps and the stamps are either 19 cents or 7 cents, well, I mean, it's impossible to make something for 20 cents because you can't make it out of 7s and 19s, but at some point eventually you can. And so the Frobenius coin problem and the postage stamp problem are all generalizations of this kind of a question. Chicken McNugget theorem is because, and Anne Lee says chicken McNugget theorem, that's because um, I think some people said chicken McNuggets used to come in boxes of 9 and boxes of 20. And so it's impossible to get 19, but after a certain point you can get all different numbers of nuggets. Okay, I, I was going to say that the, the U.S. International Math Olympiad team did something kind of, like kind of crazy a long time back, where they would always go to um, McDonald's after if, if they if, if they won the whole competition. Um, I guess it's not in celebration of the chicken McNugget theorem. Okay, next question. Hmm. Wow, so many different questions here. Okay, so so I see that some people are asking about you know some some international math Olympiad questions. So now of course that's way 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 beyond the level of what we were just talking about here. But somebody asked, did you practice number theory to to solve these very hardest questions on the international math Olympiad? And the answer is yes, but I didn't really practice. I don't go and learn a technique and just practice the technique. I just thought about the questions. And so what you saw me doing, if you watched the earlier live stream today, was similar. It's like, oh my gosh, how do you solve these problems? I don't know, but it's going to be fun. Let's go and figure it out. And that's usually what I try to do. And so through the course of doing that, I eventually learned a various, a lots of various kinds of math. And that's why one of my goals is to help all of you be able to experience that same thing too. Hmm. Somebody asked, in the counting module is the uh, confusion with Wendy's personal. So there's a certain uh, lesson I taught at some point where uh, I think I was I was showing a picture from a Wendy's bag of, of how this was about 10 years ago. If you went to Wendy's and you bought something, you got a bag. Wendy's is a burger place. And the bag said, we realized that there are 256 different ways to personalize a Wendy's burger. And that's because, you know, each thing you can either put on or off. You can have you know, you can have like ketchup or no ketchup, you can have cheese or no cheese, you can have bun or no bun, you can have um, you know, the burger or the no burger, you can have lettuce or no lettuce. I, I, unfortunately, they didn't realize that you should minus one because if you went to Wendy's and bought a burger and said, I'd like to have the no burger, no bun, no lettuce, no, no mustard, no ketchup, uh, no cheese thing, what have you just gotten? Nothing. So, so, so you, you probably need to make sure that you, you know, a, a burger with like no... Burger, uh, yeah, yeah, why not? There, there, there might be a way, some people might want the burger without the burger, P could be. But you probably don't want like the, the, the came away with an empty Wendy's bag. Okay, more questions. <laughs> more and more fun questions here. What else do we have here? Hmm. Okay. Wow, we got, we got a really, really uh, wide range of questions. I'm going to hit one which is maybe a little bit more general. How do you see education in general in the post-pandemic era? You know, what I'm going to say is I think that education during the pandemic era wasn't very fair. Um, there are some people who went and learned a lot of things, somebody who, some people who didn't. Uh, obviously, you guys are here on my YouTube channel, so you're probably among the ones who did. I will encourage you, if you end up going back to a classroom and you see that there are people who maybe spent the last entire year not learning math, uh, don't make fun of them try to help them out, right? Everyone did different things. On the other hand, it's good that you spend your time, I guess, doing hard math because you have learned how to think. And another thing is, it's not really a race. You don't need to race to be like, let me go and learn all these math facts and all these math things as fast as possible. It's actually more important to learn how to think. And so in some sense, what I think the pandemic era did is I think it slowed down the rate at which people were just picking up core, like just like math concepts which is fine if your objective is to go and learn how to think. Because actually, that's how I learned math. You know, I didn't go rush, rush, rush to go and say, I want to finish calculus by sixth grade. I didn't, I didn't even know what calculus was in sixth grade. Um, I just went and thought about hard problems. So I, my recommendation is, however long this pandemic is running, use the time to think about hard problems. You won't necessarily be ahead of other people in terms of learning more concepts, but you will have learned how to think, which is a really useful skill. Wow, so many interesting questions. Oh, somebody did want to finish calculus by sixth grade and failed. Don't worry, you didn't fail. Because actually, if you finish calculus in sixth grade, then what do you do? 
it's not completely clear. So I actually strongly believe you're much better off using, using those like elementary, middle school years, thinking about how to solve hard questions. Somebody asked, uh, yeah, how many digits of pi do I know? 3.14159926, that's it. Uh, that was only enough for a phone number. <laughs> okay, next things. Do I ingest pie regularly? Actually, not so much anymore. When I was in college, I often did enjoy pie as a dessert. I will say that actually it has nothing to do with me being a mathematician, but I find pie to be a very satisfying type of dessert. It's not like all full of air like a cake, and it's not like super dense like fudge. It's sort of this nice thing right in the middle, which uh, for me is like got, got, got enough density, but not too much density. Maybe that's just how I think about the world. Okay, more things. Oh, somebody asked, are, am I still working on Novid? Oh yeah, I am. Because I, we accidentally discovered a completely new way to fight disease. So hopefully you'll be hearing about that soon. We're, we're actually making a lot of progress. I'll, I'll continue answering other questions. Hmm. What rank, what rank did I get during the International Math Olympiad? So I, I was a low silver medal. So, so I, think, I think my rank was something around like 80th place, 90th place or something, something like that. Uh, you can find out if you just Google for me and find like Po Shan Lo International Math Olympiad. You can find it out. You can find out what happened in the year 1999. Um, and yeah, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't terrific. Um, and I think what I gained from that was basically finding out that there's a lot of smart people out there. And... It's inspiring. It's inspiring to see all these other smart people and to think maybe you can do something. Mm. Snake Queen has asked, do you publish papers? Yes, I do. Um, my past papers were mostly about mathematical things, like proving some interesting fact about networks. I'm actually working on some papers now, which are totally different. Um, now, now I'm actually writing papers together with people who work in public health and epidemiology. I never expected that I would kind of bridge over all the way from, you know, serious, just pure mathematics to suddenly writing research papers with people who are doing like really, really real things in the life sciences. But that's actually what I'm doing now. So the answer is yes, but yes, in a very unexpected way. Ah, Alex Schreer, where can you find my papers? Just search for my name on Google. You'll find my website. My website, my main one is just like, you know, about the things I do. If you go click on the thing there that goes to the CMU page, there's a Carnegie Mellon University sub page. And that has like lists of old papers that I've been writing. Ah, somebody asked, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I think that probably it was an egg because it's very hard to make a chicken without an egg. But the thing is, like, the reason why you could get an egg first is because of mutations, right? It's because, like, the thing that laid the egg was probably was not quite a chicken. But after the egg was laid, the egg had the genetic code for something that was a chicken. So that's, that's my technical answer. I think that's correct. Hmm. Other questions? We've got a few more minutes. Ah, some person has asked, how would you recommend mastering geometry and algebra? Well, again, if you saw the way that I was playing with these questions... I use the word playing with because I would look at this and I wouldn't know how to start. I'd be like, should I go this way? Should I go that way? And that's how you learn. I actually think that the way to learn is to fight against things that you don't quite know. And in the end, you saw how we did these questions. They weren't crazy, but you got to use creativity while you did it. So I really believe that if you are, say, in middle school or elementary school, go and play with these kinds of questions. And then when you finally take a real geometry class, yes, pay attention. And you'll learn like there's a lot of theory there. Actually, there's a big difference between the geometry of these math contests and the geometry class you learn in school. The geometry class you learn in school is about proving things, and that's actually important too. Okay, explain Heron's theorem, please. Ah, you were probably watching the previous live stream. So I have to say, I've done this before. Actually, we do this in our classes, but it takes about half an hour, so I, I can't quite do it here, although it is actually in our geometry class. More questions. Hmm. Oh, somebody asked, will watching your combinatorics class help with competition combinatorics? Yes, because that's how we designed it. Although I get bored just making competition problems. So what I usually do is I go and get inspired by the competition problems and think about what's actually good to teach. Uh, and so that's, that's what goes into our classes. Hmm. Oh my gosh, Toady Master, is there a perfect circle in the world? In that case, how did we know what pi was? That's a really deep question. Well, there's a good news you can actually draw a circle. You know how? You get a string and a peg 
right? You go and get a, like a, a stick, slam the stick into the ground. Big, a sword, a sword, yeah. Get a sword and stick it in the ground and like tie a, a rope to, to the, to the um, I guess, to the, to the hilt of the sword. Ideally, you want a sword which has a hole in the hilt so you can kind of, you know what I mean? I don't want the rope to wrap around the sword's hilt, but you could imagine that you had some kind of a thing which was like there was a hole, oh yeah, a hole like this, and then something stuck into the ground. You tie a rope around the hole, and then you just kind of go around in the sand with this very, very long rope. You got a circle. That's why circles are so fundamental, because you can actually draw them, and you can make them pretty perfect. How do you find pi without a circle? That's a deep question. So that's actually how they calculate pi. Because you know, if you go to Wolfram Alpha and type in pi, it is not that there is somebody who went and stuck a stick in the ground, got a rope, and then like drew the big circle and measured it and divided it. No, no, no. Actually, it turns out that pi is related to some things called infinite series. And you can sort of know that infinite series exists because there's this old paradox. Called, it's called Zeno's paradox, which is called, hey, I'll never get to the wall. I'm going to walk halfway, and then I'll walk a quarter of the way. And then I'll walk an eighth of the way. I'm talking of the total way, right? A, a half of the total, plus a quarter of the total, plus an eighth of the total, plus a sixteenth of a total. And you keep going and going and going. You never kind of get, get to the end, do you? Except that it does converge to the end. You get closer and closer to one. And so you know that it's possible to add up infinite sequences of stuff where it actually gets closer and closer to some value. And there are a lot of these types of infinite series that will give you pi. And in fact, that's one way that you find digits of pi. Wow, with that, we actually seem to have run out of time. There were too many interesting questions. Uh, I think, let me just take one more, one more, one more thing that we're going to pull off of here. And yeah, let's do this one. Procrastinators Savvy, love these names, has asked, do you prefer geometry or algebra? I'll give you an answer which you probably weren't expecting. I prefer any problem where after you solve it, you go, wow, that's nifty. Never thought I would see that, or ne never thought I'd see that number, or never thought that was possible, or never thought I'd use this way of solving the problem. The things that I like are not about a subject. They're actually about the unexpected nature of like interesting ways you could solve a question. So that's how I, that's how I sort of decide what I like. And if you can see, as I'm doing other people's problems, sometimes I get super excited because I said, wow, I never thought that you could go and do it this way, or oh, I never thought that that number would appear. But if you just give me a problem that's like, hey, do this geometry problem, you know the formula for the area, just plug it in, I'll get kind of bored. Um, I'll, I'll say like, how about, how about something where I don't know how to start? Like the question that we saw, I think, uh, earlier in this, in this live stream, which had some circles inside circles and some squares. And I was like, oh, that's really neat. Because I drew the circles to scale, I can see a pattern and I can prove the pattern, like a, a nice thing about the picture. And it works. All right. Well, with that, I guess, unfortunately, we're, we're done with our live streams for this particular weekend. But actually, if you like these things, we're going to be doing some more problems. In fact, tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we will finish the chapter invitational round of math counts. And if you were here earlier today, you saw that the questions got pretty hard. So my guess is that tomorrow we'll get some problems. The first few will probably be doable. And when we get to question number eight, we'll, prob we'll probably all be wondering, how do we do that? How do we do that? And the, and the worst part is that tomorrow, we won't even have any pi left. With that, see you all tomorrow. Happy Pi Day. Bye-bye.